we have our amplifier structure using the MOS transistor and we have also solved the problem of uh, adding the signal to the bias and at the input and subtracting the bias at the output. That is across the load we need to have only the signal part of it without any DC value and both of these are uh, achieved by using these capacitors which block DC and this is also known as AC coupling. Okay. What AC coupling allows us to do is to have uh, the same signal value here and there, but different DC values. right? If you connect a capacitor, it will block off the DC and if you choose the capacitor value to be sufficiently large, it will ensure that the two nodes are shorted for some above a certain frequency. So, the signal voltages will be the same at the two nodes for instance here and there also here and there. Okay. And to bias the MOS transistor, we can use an inductor, but it is usually too bulky for uh, low or medium frequencies. It is only at very, very high frequencies that you can reasonably use an inductor here. Okay. So, instead of an inductor, it is more common to use a resistor, but the disadvantage with the resistor is what? One is voltage drop in the operating point, but what happens to the amplifier's characteristics? Again, again reduces because it is an additional load, right? Instead of the load resistor being R L, you have R D parallel R L, the gain will be minus G M R D parallel R L, it reduces, but you have to just live with that. Okay. On the other hand, if you try to make it very large, you have to use a large supply. So, neither is uh, possible. Okay. Now, we evaluated the criterion for C 1, C 1 should be much more than 1 over omega times the resistance that appears across it which is R s plus R 1 parallel R 2 and this criterion works out quite well in practice. In case of C 2, so let us say we use R d instead of L 2 that is we use a resistor here. Okay. And if I call this V o and I call this V d s, V o by V i and for simplicity, I will show these things with R s equals 0. This is just to not have another voltage division expression involving R s and R 1 parallel R 2. If R s equals 0, uh, what is V naught by V i? We evaluated that yesterday, right? Assume that C 1 does behave like a short circuit and this is quite common. I mean, when we have multiple components, multiple reactive components, but we do not want precise values for them. We just want some uh, constraints so that they behave either like open or short circuits. When you are evaluating the constraint, you do it one by one. You assume that the others are selected properly. Okay. So, let us say C 1 does behave like a short circuit at the signal frequency. So, what is V naught by V i? We found this yesterday, right? Huh? Small signal. No, large signal it is non-linear. You cannot even write a transfer function like this. Transfer functions are meaningful only in the small signal linear regime. Okay. minus g m times this one right. So, here the purpose of writing this was to see what the criteria on C 1 I mean sorry C 2 should be. Okay. Now, this will be approximately minus g m r d parallel r l that is basically C 2 does appear like a short circuit if omega C 2 times r d plus r l is much greater than 1. Okay. So, this is fine and this also uh, is consistent with what we had said earlier that you look at what resistance appears across the capacitor and you make sure that the capacitive reactance is much smaller than that resistance. 
in the small signal picture of this circuit you know that uh, g m v g s is here r d is there c 2 and r l ok. So, across c 2 we have r d plus r l I did not write the other part of that, but we have uh, it turns out another thing to consider what is v d s by v i. What is it? Minus G M R D one plus J M C two R D plus R L. Okay. Now uh, the reason for uh, writing this out separately is the following. Okay. Let us imagine a case when R d is very large and R l is small. Okay. So, in that case you could satisfy this condition omega c 2 R d plus R l is much greater than 1 and in fact, because R d is uh, much more than R l it is only R d that counts in this summation. Okay. So, what is the problem then? Where? No, it will it should appear across R D right because they should be in parallel. The question is if R D and R L are comparable, like we do not even have to worry about all of these things. So, first of all, we know that this part that is this is the actual gain with C2 in place and that is approximately equal to this that is C 2 appears like a uh, short circuit as far as the gain is concerned, gain expression is concerned if this condition is satisfied. Okay. Let us imagine that omega C 2 R D parallel R L is much greater than 1, but omega C 2 R L that does not satisfy that. Okay. This means that R D happens to be much more than R L okay, in some particular case. So, in that case, so you understand what I am saying. So, let us say R d is very large and R l is kind of uh, small. Okay. Then, this constraint is essentially dominated by this. We have to say that omega c 2 R d is much more than 1, because R l is very small. So, in that case, what can you say about the relative magnitudes of V naught and V d s? If c 2 is really a short circuit, V naught should be V d s, right? is not it? If this is a short circuit, the signal here and the signal there should be exactly the same. Okay. But what happens in this case? When omega c to R L is not very large, but omega c to R D can be very large. Okay. Okay. Which one will be more? I mean, which one? Which will be a bigger sinusoid? V naught or V D S? V D S, obviously. Okay. So, the point is this I mean if the impedance if R d is very very large and R l is not so large the in the this condition only says that the reactance of C 2 has to be much smaller than R d plus R l, but it could be comparable to R l it is possible if R d happens to be very large. Then what happens is that although the voltage that appears across R l is approximately this the voltage drop across C 2 could be comparable to voltage drop across R L. Okay. So, it is still small compared to the voltage drop across R D, but uh, I mean sorry the reactance of uh, C 2 is still small compared to R D, but the voltage drop here and there could be comparable. Then what happens is that the voltage drop across the transistor this V D S can be more than the actual output voltage. Now, that is not necessarily a problem at this level. I mean right now we cannot say what the problem is, but you know that the MOS transistor is a nonlinear device okay. and the larger the signal you have across any nonlinear device the more it deviates from our assumption of linearity. Okay. So, you would not only like to have this condition, but also the drain source voltage to be approximately equal to or the same as the voltage across the load. 
okay so clearly if rd and rl were comparable then this condition automatically means that there will be very little voltage drop across it it's only in this weird case where let's say rd is 1 mega ohm and rl is 1 kilo ohm and if i set the reactance of c2 to 100 kilo ohm it will satisfy this condition on the other hand there is a substantial drop across c2 as well okay so the voltage drop across the transistor could be about 10 times the voltage drop voltage at the output so that's a problem because it's a nonlinear device and any large swing unnecessarily large swing means that you also have unnecessarily large nonlinearity okay so typically at the output it's not enough to just make sure that the reactance of the capacitor is much smaller than the resistance across it that we have already satisfied okay so what is the condition we need to make v not approximately equal to vds just look at the expressions and tell me we have the expression for v not we have the expression for vi okay what is that where yeah 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 that's correct thanks this is rd plus rl so looking at these two expressions tell me what is the condition that makes vds approximately equal to v not yeah omega c to rl yeah so if this the magnitude of this part is much more than 1 then clearly you can neglect this and this and that become almost the same okay so the condition we usually use at the output is that omega c to rl must be much greater than 1 okay so i emphasize this because earlier i said that the rule is hey you look at the capacitor you look at the resistance across it and make sure that the reactance is much smaller than that that actually works for circuits like this but we will later see cases where you either have a very large rl or a effectively a very large rl like having a current source there which has an infinite resistance okay so clearly sorry rd instead of rd if rd was infinity then any value of capacitor will do that's what it says right because anything will be smaller than any uh, re capacitive reactance will be smaller than infinity but then what happens is the drain voltage becomes very large okay so to avoid that you want to make the capacitive reactance to be much smaller than rl and this is an issue only when rd much more than rl okay yeah so the input signal that you can apply the amplitude that you can apply while keeping it in saturation will be small if vds is large we'll come to that part later yes what's that no i don't want actually v not what i really mean is that i don't want i don't want vds to be more than v not okay there is no need for it to be okay so if you look at the amplifier here the small signal picture rl appears directly across the drain and source okay so according to this picture if c2 is a short vds should be exactly equal to v not it is v not that we care about that is what drives the following stage but vds if it does become too large it will drive the transistor more into nonlinear region okay so we'll see that later there is something known as uh, uh, swing limit which is the limit on the amplitude of the signal that you can apply while keeping the transistor in saturation so clearly if the drain source voltage is changing too much then it will take it out of saturation it's possible okay it will care about the yeah yeah because then that will automatically satisfy the other condition right so so this is a stronger condition to make not only see the first condition this condition here it says that the gain will be the same as if c2 was short circuited the output voltage will be the same the other condition says that not only will the output voltage be this thing but vds will be equal to v not okay so it's an additional constraint now the reason i mentioned it is because earlier we used an inductor to
realize the DC bias. Okay, that was another way to do it. L2, C2 and RL. Okay. Now, what was the constraint on L2? If C2 is a short indeed, what is the constraint on L2? What was it? Yeah. So, omega L2 must be much larger than RL. Okay. So, that ensures that it is like an open circuit, no current flows in it. But then, so, then while calculating the value of uh, C 2, so let us say I just open circuit this, I remove that altogether. Okay. If you use the earlier criterion, that, uh, that reactance of C 2 must be much more than the reactance, sorry, the resistance that appears across it, what do you get here? What is the resistance that appears across it? Huh? No, the resistance that appears across C 2. When V i equals 0, what happens to that current source? It is an open circuit. So, what is the resistance that appears across C 2? Infinite. Okay. So, then clearly you cannot find a legitimate value for C 2. So, what you want is really that this and that voltage to be the same. So, that will happen if omega C 2 or C 2 is much greater than 1 over omega R L. Okay. This is fine. So, later if you work out examples, this will become clearer. Okay. Any questions on this? So, at least now we have some, uh, we have an amplifier structure using a MOS transistor, we know how to do the biasing, we know how to apply the signal and take out the signal and we can do it for realistic source and loads. That is, we do not need this to be a voltage source like this, it can be any stage we can do this, it will not disturb the previous stage because we are only AC coupling it, right. It will not disturb the operating point of the previous stage. Similarly, the operating point of the following stage will not be disturbed. This R L is the equivalent resistance, this will not do anything to it. So, this is actually a usable amplifier. Okay. So, any questions about anything we did? Yeah. Yeah, it reduces the gain, that is the. Yeah, if you had an inductance, what would be the gain? If you had an inductance that is very large, what would be the gain? GMRL. So, instead of GMRL, now you have GMRD parallel RL, which will be smaller. Right? Okay. Now, you can try to mitigate this by having RD much more than RL, but then that comes with the price that the DC voltage drop across this will be too much and you have to use a very large supply. Okay. How will you do that? Okay. What will be the drain voltage at this point? Across the? No. Okay. You DC couple this. First of all, this may not be possible because this now enforces that the output voltage of this should be the same as the operating point input voltage of the following stage. Like I said, RL is not just an isolated resistor. Okay. So, it uh, the following stage is DC operating point may be disturbed because of this. Okay. Who knows what it wants, right? That is a, so we cannot do it like this. And additionally, what should be, so whatever voltage you have here, if it is a resistor, this resistor will be unnecessarily carrying a DC and it is wasting power. Okay. So, we will bias it later using a current source, but not like this. Okay. Any questions? So, this it turns out is the most basic amplifier structure using a MOS transistor and in the incremental uh, picture assuming the capacitors are shorted and inductors are opened and so on. You can see that this is the gate of the transistor, the source and the drain. The input is applied between gate and source the output is taken between drain and source. So, the source is the common terminal to the input and output. So, this amplifier is known as the common 
source amplifier okay so this is the most basic amplifier structure using a mos transistor this is fine any questions about anything else now you should i mean if you are given a mosfet and you know its characteristics you should be able to bias it and get some gain design it for whatever gain as uh, usual i would encourage you to just put some numerical values and work out things rather than just listening to the lectures right otherwise you won't get anything out of these lectures what sir yeah no no so first of all we have in this case if you use rd okay if you use this structure then the quiescent vds is vdd minus the quiescent current times rd and the quiescent vgs is r2 by r1 plus r2 times vdd okay so in design usually what happens is and this is the way we worked out as well you know the transconductance because you have to drive a certain load resistance and get a certain gain the transconductance gives you the value of id0 okay and you either choose vdd and choose rd or the other way around you choose rd and then choose vdd okay i mean it could be too large okay it could be much larger then the disadvantage is you will use a much larger supply if it is much smaller then the gain will be determined by rd so you may have to go back to the drawing board and re uh, evaluate i mean recalculate the gm that you want to have okay so that happens many times so let's say the load was uh, 100 kilo ohms and then you had this idea that hey i'll uh, have that as the load and i calculate the gm to be 200 micro siemens to get a gain of minus 20 but then uh, then uh, what happens is that you have to use some rd and that rd cannot be very large you can't use mega ohms of rd let's say so in that case you have to increase the gm or do something else okay so you will have to go back to the drawing board okay what is that stable as in what i mean what is an unstable circuit this is yeah this is very much stable yeah this is a memoryless circuit right what's yeah it has capacitors but the capacitors act like short circuits and so on so and all the if you look at it you had capacitors and positive resistors across them so if you have capacitors and positive resistors you have positive time constants all the transient responses will die out as exponential something okay so this will be stable so it's only when you have uh, multiple poles in a feedback loop or you have capacitors or inductors across a negative resistance that you have instability right? where you apply a voltage and current gets pushed out oh yeah, i think you can make it in many ways we'll see later how to do it i mean you can always imagine some non linear device which uh, first of all if you have a voltage controlled current source and let's say this is vx and this is some g times vx okay now if you connect it up like that that's a negative resistance right so you can realize it using non linear components so uh now if you use an inductor the equations will change if you use an inductor here l2 then vds0 will be vdd and vgs will be the same so it's just that you may use a different value of vdd here and there but you do know how to calculate it because the operating point tells you what bias current to use what vgs to use okay and you know what vds to use because you have to keep the transistor in saturation region 
So, so far that is the those are the constraints we have and with that you can get some values for these ok. And like with anything else in design you would not get uh, you would not have a set of equations I mean here how many components do we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 like 6 equations which will give you the values of 6 components that is not going to happen ok. So, some things you may have to choose I mean for instance one obvious thing is if I choose VDD larger than necessary instead of 23 volts I use 30 volts I mean I can still make the circuit I will alter the components slightly and nothing will happen to the circuit ok. So, that is very much possible. So, that is the common source amplifier. Now, uh, we can go on and first of all uh, there are a number of things to do uh, it, this it turns out is not a great way of biasing it works, but it is not great because the semiconductor characteristics invariably uh, change quite a lot with temperature and then also if you take different MOS transistors their uh, mu and C ox will be different from each other their uh, threshold voltages will be different from each other. So, if you have a design that is you determine the values of R 1, R 2, R D and so on and then you buy a whole batch of transistors populate a bunch of boards to and then uh, measure the gains they will all be different ok and uh, worse if you measure it uh, at room temperature and at some hot uh, at some higher temperature or lower temperature they will also vary substantially ok. So, you would like to have as little sensitivity to as th uh, those things as possible. So, we will investigate other means of uh, other uh, techniques for biasing ok. But before that we will uh, switch gears and do something else ok this usually used to come at the end of the course, but unfortunately then that also meant that the uh, end of the course would consist of a lot of heavy material involving feedback and so on. So, we have now moved it to the beginning. So, we will discuss uh, feedback loops and stability right now ok. I will give you some motivation about why we need this, but uh, uh, we will discuss that right now at the control source level that is we would not know how to make the op amp let us say at the transistor level that we will know only at the end of the course, but we will be well prepared because we will know how to stabilize the feedback loop and so on. Have you done control systems course already? you are doing it now. So, yeah that is not going to help right. So, <laughs> now one of the things have you used op amps or uh, encountered op amps before yeah EMC nowhere else ok fine what is the characteristic of an op amp or what is the key characteristic of an op amp infinite gain ok. So, now basically I showed that picture of the op amp uh, at the beginning of the course and said you will be able to make this and understand it at the end of the course. So, that means that you have to realize infinite gain how will you do that ok. So, we have very high gain. So, let us say uh, thousands or uh, ten thousands or hundred thousand something like that. So, the bottom line is we have to realize very high gains. Now, we have one way of making one way of realizing gain which is this what is the gain of this and let us say we bias it with an inductor and so on. So, that there are no extra components at all the gain of a common source amplifier ok and let me take the most basic form of it which is to say So, we will have a gain of minus g m r l let us not even worry about uh, supply voltage and all these things. So, this at least makes it appear that if I go on increasing r l I have to increase the supply voltage of course, but the gain will go on increasing ok. So, for instance let us say I want a gain of 1000 and my g m is 200 micro Siemens what should be the value of r l Five thousand what? Five mega ohms. Okay, so RL will be five mega ohms. And what will be the supply voltage? So let's say bias it at the edge of saturation. Three volts is just about what you can tolerate, right? You are need more than that. So what will be the supply voltage? Hmm? Thousand three volts. Yeah. So, clearly this is not feasible, but even if it this were it is not going to work like this ok. The model of the transistor we have considered is not complete we said that 
in saturation region I d is mu 1 C ox by 2 w by L V g s minus V t squared. Okay. This is when the transistor is on and V d s is more than V g s minus V t. Okay. So, by the way let me clarify the goal again. The overall goal is to make a high gain amplifier. Why do we do that? Why do we need a high gain amplifier? So, the point about high gain is if you have very high gain in inside a feedback loop you have this business of virtual short. Okay. So, what all the good stuff that comes about comes from negative feedback that you will see this uh, g over have you done g over 1 plus g h already in the you have done. What have you done in control system so far? Huh? No, no, have you done feedback loops or not? Huh? Yeah. So, I think the so this is the classic picture you see, right? What do you call this u and y or something? Okay. What is y by u? G by 1 plus g h. But what is good about a negative feedback loop? Yeah, why? What do you want the value of g h to be? The whole business of negative feedback loop is somehow in some desired range of frequencies or in some domain get the magnitude of g h to be much, much more than 1. Okay. Then what happens? What is this approximately equal to? 1 by h. And also when uh, uh, magnitude of g h is much more than 1, what will be this quantity? Y h, what will that be? It will be u. Okay. That is the virtual short between these two points, okay, just like in an op amp. So, if g h is very, very large, those two become equal. So, essentially the whole business of negative feedback is you have some desired quantity which you can call u and you have the actual quantity which is y modified by some transfer function. You make the desired equal to actual by driving the output so that the error reduces. That is the whole idea behind negative feedback and it works only if the magnitude of g h is much more than 1. So, one way or the other you have to be able to implement some gain that is very, very large okay, in an absolute sense. In our case, of course, the op amp is what you use for negative feedback circuits and we realize op amps and op amp is useful only if it has gain which is very high. What is very high can be different depending on different contexts, but it cannot be gain of 2, right? that is not going to do anything useful. Okay. So, now uh, additional thing is that when you write it like this, you can see that the gain has become independent of g. Okay. So, if g provides a very high gain, then it does not matter how much it varies. If it varies from 1000 to 10,000, oh, it is a factor of 10 variation, but it does not matter at all because uh, for all values of g, you will have the nearly the same transfer function. So, that is the uh, that is the business of low sensitivity of negative feedback systems to some variations. Okay. So, at least you should be convinced that you need to realize high gains. Okay. So, we try to make it using a single common source amplifier does not seem to work needs like kilovolts of supply it is not going to happen. Okay. Now, even if you did manage this 1000 volts of supply it is not going to work because this is the characteristic we assumed in saturation and we know how it looks like. It is parabolic up to V g s minus V t and then after that it remains constant. Okay. So, what is the incremental resist resistance? What is y 2 2 of the MOS transistor according to this model? 0, but okay, this model is wrong. Okay. So, it turns out that it does not quite look like this. It has some slope. Okay. So, I mean this was too good to be true, you knew that right, <laughs> y 2 2 being 0, this was not going to happen. So, uh, already i z equal to 0, that is too good to be true, but it is almost true, but uh, this one is not true at all. So, the actual model of the MOS transistor, it turns out is not actual, this is like a next level of approximation it is 1 plus lambda times V d s. There is some model that will tell you that there is some slope, there is some uh, increase uh, of current with V d s. Earlier, in saturation region, the current was independent of the drain source voltage. Now, it does very much depend on the drain source voltage. It increases 
with drain source voltage. This lambda can be small, but it is not 0. Okay. So, let us say lambda is some 0 0.02 inverse volts or something. The units of this are inverse volts, so that lambda BDS is dimensionless. Okay. So, this is the model of the MOS transistor. So, what does it mean for the small signal parameters? Which small signal parameter does it change? Y22. Okay. What is the value of Y22? Please evaluate. Evaluate it. Yeah. What is the value of Y22 in saturation region? Earlier it was 0, but what is it? very easily see that this Y22 which by the way is denoted by GDS that is the conductance between drain and source in a MOS transistor is the partial derivative of ID with respect to VDS and that is mu and C ox by 2 W by L VGS minus VT square times lambda. Okay. Well, lambda is some small number, but definitely not 0. Okay. So, now this means that the output conductance of the MOS transistor is not 0. So, what does it do to the gain of our amplifier or what does it do to the small signal picture of our amplifier? Yeah. So, our MOS model for the MOS transistor must include GDS okay. and this is part of the MOS transistor, you cannot remove this. So, what is the maximum gain that you can get ever with 1000 or 10000 volt supply anything that you want to have? Hmm? What is the maximum magnitude of the gain you can get? Earlier how did we increase gain? So, GMRL we went on increasing RL. Now, let us say you keep doing that you make RL nearly infinite what happens what will be the gain? What will be the gain of the GDS is the conductance right? That's Yeah, so it is basically by the way if I call this the reciprocal of 1 by RDS where RDS is the resistance, it is RDS parallel RL that will be the total load. So, essentially you have some load within the MOS transistor okay, besides the external load that you connect that is this RDS which you cannot get it off at all. So, there is some inherent gain limitation in a MOS transistor. You can try to increase this it turns out that if you increase the length L of the MOS transistor it increases, but realistic values for this are certainly not more than 100 and in modern technologies maybe more like 10 okay so it's quite quite pathetic actually so how do we get so this is just to show you that there is some inherent gain limitation in the mos transistor itself okay so earlier it looked like the gain is gmrl you go on increasing rl you will increase the gain but it's really gm rds parallel rl and rds is something that comes as a package deal with the mos transistor so you can't uh, you can't remove that okay so there is some inherent gain limitation. Okay. GDS is the output conductance. So, the gain will be only less than or equal to G m by G D S that is the magnitude of the gain of a common source amplifier okay. and this is you can say it is a few tens it is not going to be more than that usually. Okay. Yeah, you make any other amplifier you will have the same problem okay. using a single MOS transistor this is what you can get. So, let us say you have I mean this is what you have to live with each device can only give you this much gain, 
but the you want gain of uh, 1 million or something what do you have to do yeah what can you do if you have a gain of 10 like how could you get gain of 1000 you have to put uh, one gain after another okay you have to, yeah so that's called cascading so let's say you had a gain of 10 so that means that v o 1 is 10 times v i then you put three of these things together what is what will be the gain 1000 okay so if each one has a gain of 10 the three of them will have 1000 and you, it looks like there is no limit i can put six and get a million and so on okay where is the catch huh? noise okay that's not a why no why 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 is supply voltage a problem no no why is that a problem i mean no no why do you need supply voltage to be higher why you can have any gain you want it only supply voltage probably only limits how much input you can apply i'll apply only one micro volt so after a gain of one million i'll get only one volt okay which can be safely accommodated within the supply that you mentioned okay so that's not a concern because see with the ac coupling and so on the small signal gain of 10 that we can easily realize we've already done that okay you put like uh, 10 of them together and you look get 10 to the 10 okay yeah it is small yeah what is vi in an op amp i know but what will be the input voltage in an op amp nearly zero right no it won't be small the output voltage of the op amp is not small no no that's not uh, true oh, 100 vi what is small i mean 100 vi could be 100 millivolts right i mean <laughs> there is uh, why no why why it will get amplified let it get amplified what is that uh, no i mean i don't see that as a problem at all right why or oh, i didn't understand what the point you made us Three millivolts. Why? Why is that? I mean, don't worry about the size of the signal, right? See, in an op amp, the it has infinite gain, and the input signal is zero. The output signal is whatever is decided by the feedback network, and exactly the same thing will happen here. Okay. There are some limits to signals that you can apply to any nonlinear device. We haven't discussed it at all, so we are not equipped to discuss it. But I'll say that. Whatever argument you make, I'll say my output uh, signal is only one millivolt. Now you calculate the what the what the input signal is. In this, the input signal will be one microvolt. That is fine. What might be the problem? I mean, this. By the way, this is an op amp. So how do we use an op amp in a feedback loop? Okay. So the problem comes when you try to make this and use it in a feedback loop. There is actually no problem with uh, cascading three amplifiers. You can cascade three or thirty. Okay may not be very useful because the errors will keep building up and so on but there is a more severe problem when you try to make an op amp like this because it doesn't look too difficult right okay hey gain of uh, 10000 i just put four of these together uh, and i'll make i mean transistors are cheap anyway on an integrated circuit i can put any number of them but uh, you have to close the loop you have to realize a negative feedback loop around four stages okay it turns out that is a big problem so that's what we are going to study next okay so that's why i mean this is kind of a discontinuity in the course normally we would discuss the basic amplifier structures and then uh, uh, go to more and more complicated stuff but just so that you are familiar with all this feedback related things before we come to the end of the course i'll do it now but uh, right now we'll do it only at the control source level we'll just imagine that there is some uh, amplifier of gain whatever okay but it also comes with i mean you can't it turns out if you make an amplifier you will not get a gain like 10 you will have 10 divided by 1 plus s by something you will have a pole at least one pole associated with each amplifier 
So now when you have this gain and uh, pole and then you put a number of them together in a negative feedback loop, I mean things can go haywire, that is what we will see. Okay? So before we get there, just a few comments about this model. Now this business of uh, getting lambda, it is known as channel length modulation. This term would not make any sense at all until you see this in solid state devices. You the effectively what causes the, uh, I mean you can think of whatever causes the change in current in saturation region, it is something like electrically changing the length of the MOS transistor. Okay? It turns out it is like that, we do not have to worry about why it is like that, we just think of the model. Okay? Now what we have is also a very, very crude model, but it is already too complicated also. So for instance, earlier we had in the triode region. and in the saturation region. Okay. And this would give you I D versus V D S which is like that. Okay. Now, it turns out that this channel length modulation applies only in saturation region anyway. Okay, and it is modeled like this. This is the convention. It is some crude model for a current that increases in saturation region. So, what will the curve look like? Huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this, uh, this applies only for saturation region. So, what will the I D versus V D S curve look like? I D versus V D S, the same curve that I have drawn. Huh? Exponential, why? No, no, I mean it is the same curve, I have whatever I have drawn in black, I drew the curve here. What will it be after this modification and lambda is a small number? Discontinuity, actually if you model it like this, earlier this part and this part were exactly the same at this point, Vgs minus Vt. Now with this addition, it would not be. Okay. So that is what it looks like. Now, we cannot throw the 1 plus lambda V D S into the other one because that makes no physical sense at all. Okay? This phenomenon applies only in saturation region. So, like good engineers, we just ignore all these inconsistencies and move on. That's all. Okay? So, we cannot do anything else. The actual MOS transistor characteristic is of course continuous. It will not jump like this, but uh, we will still use this. And also, even with this, this is already too complicated to use for operating point calculations. So, unless otherwise mentioned for operating point calculations. So, ignore this lambda or the channel length modulation and it is only in the small signal picture. So, the only thing that happens is you do all the calculations like before and in the small signal picture, you throw in this uh, output conductance and the value of the output conductance by the way is uh, this is lambda times mu and c ox by 2 w by l. V G S minus V T square and this itself is approximately equal to the quiescent drain current. It is not exactly the drain current, obviously it is missing that 1 plus lambda V D S factor. So, we approximate G D S to lambda times I D. Okay? So, most of the time what you do is you use the simple model without this lambda for operating point calculations and in the small signal picture, you throw in an output conductance which is equal to lambda I D in parallel with drain and source. Okay? I mean, these are the things we have to do for hand calculations. The simulator, of course, will incorporate this and its model is lot more sophisticated. So, it does not have those discontinuities at the threshold and so on. Okay. Whereas, for hand calculations, we do use that, but uh, that is okay. I think we can still calculate something. That is the important thing. So, generally, unless I mean, sometimes we do have some problems where we want to see what happens to the operating point with this channel length modulation but most of the time we do not do that. We just use the original equations and not do anything else. Okay? Any questions on any of this? From the next class onwards, we will see what happens if you do try to have a cascade of a number of amplifiers and put it in feedback.